Hello and welcome to the latest presentation of the Rift Valley webinar series. My name is Anne Kruijt and I'm the host for today's talk. If you're participating in the live webinar, webinar, you can submit questions or comments in the chat module of the Zoom application at any time during the presentation or ask a voice question by raising your hand once the presentation is complete. Today's speaker is Helen Ethan. Helen is currently working in the Mabaya cluster project in Tanzania and also works as a linguistic consultant and branch linguistics coordinator for the Uganda Tanzania branch of SIL. She wrote her PhD thesis uh, in 2002 on the grammar of focus in Sandawe. Her research interests include Sandawe, particularly grammar and discourse, Bantu languages, tense aspect moods, and orthography. Uh, please join me in welcoming Helen today as she gives her talk on word order variation in Sandawe. Thank you. Word order variation in Sandawe is not a topic which I'm currently researching, but it is one I've touched on when looking at other phenomena. And it struck me that there are several interesting features which relate to word order variation in Sandawi. And these are features which may be of interest to those working on neighboring languages, and perhaps especially to those who are interested in comparative research in the Rift Valley area. This talk will be structured in quite a simple way. My approach has been to bring together some word order phenomena which I consider unusual or interesting in some way and illustrate them with examples from my data corpus, um, mainly using non-translated written texts in this case. I'll start with some comments about basic constituent order in Sandawi and how that interacts with subject marking, morpheme placement and information structure. And then I'll look at some word order issues relating to noun phrases, conjunctions and verbs. If we define basic constituent order as the order of subject, verb and object in affirmative, declarative main clauses, which are pragmatically unmarked, then Sandawi has the basic order SOV, as shown in this example. Kiso sonso, mokondong, atwaso. Two were to follow the tracks. SOV order is less common among African languages than worldwide. Heine found that 71% of African languages are SVO, which is a higher percentage than worldwide. So Sandawi is unusual in Africa in that sense. And in this example, the order of subject and object could be reversed without the constituents swapping roles because of the agreement marking. The verbal suffix so is for a third person plural animate subject, which can only be giso sonso in this example. The specificity marker, which is floating low tone and nasalization shown by a tilde in the orthography, is present on both NPs and the agreement markers that come along with it show that it's only giso sonso, which is animate. The other NP is inanimate. And this is a key point in understanding constituent order variation in Sandawi. It's possible without ambiguity because subject marking makes it so. All the six logically possible orders of S, O and V are grammatical, as shown here in Sandawi. And in realis clauses, the distribution of subject marking morphemes will very commonly make it clear which constituent is the subject and which is the object, regardless of position. When I say subject marking morphemes, I mean either of two types of morpheme, the realis pronominal clitic or RPC, which attaches to one or more non-subject clause constituent and agrees with the subject and another clitic, the subject focus marker, which attaches to the subject itself. We can see these uh, morphemes in action in a couple of sentences now. Firstly, in two, Ursa menatsi, she is or was very happy. So here we have a non-subject clause constituent, an adverb, and it's followed by the third person feminine singular RPC, and the verb is unmarked. And then in three, tame chunswa me natsi, the woman is or was happy. Now we've got a subject NP, which is marked with the subject focus morpheme R. It's also possible to have one or more realis pronominal clitic and the subject focus marker in the same clause, subject though to certain conditions. And something interesting, which has been noted by several linguists working on Sandawi is that 
the grammaticality of the distribution of these subject marking morphemes relates to the order of constituents. There are two restrictions. One is that a verb which does not carry an RPC must not precede the first subject marking morpheme of a clause. The other is that a verb which does carry the RPC must not be preceded by a constituent bearing a subject marking morpheme. So looking at these in action now, the following eight combinations of constituent order and subject marking are ungrammatical by the first restriction, because in each instance we have a verb not carrying um, a subject marking morpheme, which precedes the first one in the clause. And an additional 10 combinations of constituent order and subject marking are ungrammatical by the second restriction. So in all of these, the verb is marked with the RPC, but so is something else before it and therefore it doesn't meet uh, the second restriction. We can also rule out subject marking and uh, constituent order combinations which contain no subject marking morphemes at all. So that accounts for a further six options which are ungrammatical in addition to the, the ones shown here. And that means in total, we've rejected 24 of the logically possible combinations of subject, object and verb, each with a subject marking morpheme or not. And we're left wonderfully neatly with 24 combinations which are grammatical. This raises an interesting question, namely, why? How has this system developed? I'm going to leave that as an open question though. Another question, which I will try to address in part at least, is whether these 24 combinations of subject marking and constituent order, which are grammatical, are actually attested in natural language use and not just in illustration. To that, I would say firstly that SOV does predominate, both OSV and VS occur commonly enough though, and suggest particular information structure interpretations, as I will show shortly. It should also be said that it's very common for multiple non-subject constituents to be followed by realis pronominal clitic when occurring before the verb. This is a quite extreme example of this. Every non-subject constituent before the verb, of which there are five, is followed by the first person singular realis pronominal clitic so we have hewekes, dechlas, dikimangs, klas, anit eonas, be. And so I put my poisoned arrow completely well on the bowstring. So we have one of these realist pronominal clitics on the sentence initial conjunction, one each on the two adverbs completely and well, one on the object noun phrase my poisoned arrow, and one on the position postpositional phrase to or on the bowstring. The verb is the only constituent without one. And because of the restrictions we just saw, it could not have one in that position because it's coming after constituents which are already subject marked. This is an unusual example in that there are fly five clausal constituents before the verb. But in the data I've worked with, it's not actually unusual to have all the non-subject constituents before the verb subject marked. There aren't usually that many of them, though. Um, but this example is from a natural non-translated text. As you can see, the NP and the postpositional phrase are both marked with a single clitic at the right edge of the phrase, as we would expect. Both phrases contain two elements in an associative or a genitive relationship marked by tone in speech and by a hyphen in the orthography. And uh, we'll look more, more carefully at these examples shortly. But before we do that, I'd like to share a few examples of departures from the basic subject, object, verb, constituent order with some suggestions as to reasons for the different orders. So here we have OSV. These the children would eat. The demonstrative in this example is perhaps the giveaway. So hewehe refers to various meats which have been listed in the preceding sentence. And a similar example in six, hesu damans apumame dukei. This calf, your maternal uncle, will contribute. So again, we have OSV order. There is an initial 
object NP, um, which has actually also been mentioned in the preceding sentence of the discourse. So we have OSV for topicalization of the object. OSV seems to be more common in irrealist clauses like these two than in realist clauses like the ones we were looking at with all the subject marking morphemes. A possible reason for this is that in a realist clause, simply not having a realist pronoun or clitic on the object indicates or can indicate that it's a topic, whereas this option is not available in the irrealist because only the verb can be marked in agreement with the subject. The default position for an object is immediately pre-verbal, and this is the focus position in the irrealis. So when the object is a topic, the order OSV can be employed so that it doesn't occupy the focus position. The cause of VS constituent order is less clear, but some examples such as this one suggest that participant reference may play a role. So here we have the next day along came donkey. And in the discourse prior to this example, donkey has been introduced, has taken part in the events of the narrative. Then he leaves the scene and when he returns, he does so post verbally. There are other examples suggesting that VS uh, may be associated with uh, indicating a contrast or perhaps a, a clarification. The post-verbal material in particular would be a clarification. I'd like to turn now to word order in noun phrases. And we've already seen this example eight in relation to subject marking. It contains the two NPs, uh, which are in a particular structure the second of the end piece is itself in a postpositional phrase. So my poisoned arrow and bowstring, they are examples of a very, of a very common structure in Sandawe. A modifier, which is a pronoun or a noun, is followed by head noun and the result is an associative or a genitive. The tone pattern of the head noun is normally lowered in this structure and this is how the structure can be disambiguated from two juxtaposed NPs. There are two exceptions to this tone lowering and both can be described with reference to the tone melody of the head and modifier. The tone pattern of the head is not lowered if it has a high low, to high low tone melody and follows a high tone or if it follows a modifier with an all low tone melody. However, regardless of whether the tonal lowering of the head marks the sequence of the two words as unambiguously one NP, the word order of modifier and then head is fixed. Example nine gives us uh, a nice case of a double genitive. So we have Aikon, Kume, Ringiso, or Manchakso. They would feed the child millet, flour, porridge. So we have flour as the head and millet as the modifier, and then together they are the modifier of porridge. So it is porridge or flour of millet or millet flour porridge. Again, this is a fixed order in the noun phrase. Adjectives follow the noun, as we can see in 10. Then elephant took a big tree trunk and, and so the modifiers. Many frogs are swimming in a puddle. The quantifier is derived from a verb, uh, de, to be many. And 12 gives us an example of uh, where the head of a noun phrase can be both preceded by and followed by modifiers. If there is both a possessive relationship and a post head modifier like an adjective. So ji rung is the um, possessive relationship, my hand, and then klau, adjective. So chi klung klau, my right hand or my good hand, literally. Demonstrative order is more flexible. Again, I'm repeating an example we've seen, hesu damans, this calf. Um, so demonstrative can precede the noun, but it's also possible to have the reverse order as in and this pregnancy, this stomach literally, was the fifth. 
I haven't investigated the reason for this variation, but Sander Steyman has, and he found that phrases with an initial demonstrative and a definiteness, definiteness marker are pragmatically marked and express either contrastive fo focus or specificity. No, not this man, that one, or that man out of the group. So in 13, the implication is perhaps that there were other calves which would be contributed by other relatives or involved in some way in what's being talked about at this point. Leaving noun phrases to one side now, an interesting feature of Sandawi which relates to word order variation is the functional difference in where certain conjunctions are placed in the clause. And these conjunctions can be termed uh, narrative conjunctions or subjunctive or imperative conjunctions, uh, depending on which set they come from. The narrative conjunctions occur in clauses narrating a sequence of events, and in this use they correspond functionally to Swahili ka. The conjunctions are subject marked, that is, they agree with the subject of the clause they introduce. So here in 15, ah ne wa yo, then they lived for a while. There is a third person plural subject, and the only indicator of this is the conjunction choice because it's third person plural. The verb ne, though, is necessarily has a plural subject, so that part is actually clear from the verb choice. And then the second clause, sa mum sun swa abiso sa koe, and the wife became pregnant. So now the subject switches to third person feminine singular, and therefore the narrative conjunction used is sa, not a. And in this second clause, there's also an overt subject NP, followed itself by the subject focus clitic, and an object with the third person feminine singular realis pronominal clitic. So in contrast to the first clause, the conjunction is not the sole indicator of the subject. In fact, we have three indicators of the subject. And another set of subject mark conjunctions carry a subjunctive or imperative meaning, as in 16, where the conjunction is first person plural, akiko o ni, get down and let's go. So o is the first person plural subjunctive conjunction. In this basic use, either the narrative or subjunctive or imperative use, the conjunctions often occur clause initially, but sometimes after a temporal expression or after the subject. But what is um, important is that they occur before the verb. There's no flexibility in their position relative to the verb. If they do occur after the verb, we have something very different going on. Um, and we can see this in 17. So here we have One day we went hunting pigs because they had eaten another friend's field. So we've got two clauses separated by the red line. The subject of the first is first person plural, we. And the subject of the second is third person plural, they, the pigs. Notice that the narrative conjunction is found at the end of the second clause, but in terms of agreement, it agrees with the subject of the first. And that is where we get the meaning of because. The meaning of the structure is to show that the second clause is the cause of the first clause. And in 18, we've got a parallel example, this time with a subjunctive conjunction. Do loco trinke que eso go chew slowly, otherwise they will hear. Again, the red line separates the two clauses. The subject of the first is second person singular, and the subject of the second is third person plural. The subjunctive conjunction at the end of the second clause, again, agrees with the subject of the first. And this time we have a relationship of possible consequence between the two clauses. Again, an open question of a very similar kind to my first one, how would such a system develop? And are there any parallels in any neighboring languages? Finally, I'd like to look at some data related to word order in multiverb constructions. We've already seen example 19 about the frog swimming in the puddle. There are two verbs here, ne and punduse, stay and swim. Together, they're expressing one event, swimming with continuous aspect. 
As we can see here, the two verbs can be separated by another constituent, such as a postpositional phrase. The verbs are linked, though, by the connective morpheme on the first verb, which is floating high tone and nasalization shown by the tilde. The order here of stay before the other verb in the construction is by far the most common, but the reverse order is also possible and attested, as in 20. Hinsonso kea neng, the others were listening. I'm not sure whether there is a particular information structure interpretation associated with this order, or whether it's preferred when the verb is the subject marked constituent in the clause as ke is here. Note that either way, the connective is still on the stay verb, even though it's now clause final and it has a, a linking function, can be glossed almost as and, listen, stay, and. And this is required for the, con the continuous aspect meaning. If the connective were on the other verb, the meaning would be that the subject stayed and then listened, that is two separate events. The order of the verbs in constructions of this type depend on the type of verb. Another common combination involves the verb klemse, meaning finish, as in 21, hia hok ang klemsei, when it has finished getting lukewarm. Klemse commonly and possibly always, I'm not sure, comes after the verb. So it's showing an iconic order, the getting lukewarm. Um, begins before the finishing. The connective morpheme must come on the hok a verb, regardless of the order though. Otherwise the clause would mean when it has finished some other action and then got warm, again, describing two separate events. As the placement of the connective morpheme is the crucial factor in examples such as these, there is room for flexibility in the relative order of the two verbs, although the orders in 19 and 21 certainly predominate. If in these examples we want to call swim, listen, and be lukewarm, the main verbs, and stay and finish the auxiliaries, then we have both auxiliary main and main auxiliary orders in the patterns which predominate. But this is perhaps not the best way to describe the system in Sandawi, as the order depends on the meaning contributed by the auxiliary verb, if that really is the right thing uh, to call it. As I've simply presented a selection of phenomena which relate to word order variation, I have no conclusion as such. But in summary, Sandawe exhibits freedom in subject, object and verb order and more fixed order within noun phrases. But with both, there are pra pragmatically determined variations from basic orders. The placement of certain conjunctions determines whether two clauses are narrating a sequence of events or giving a cause or possible consequence of an event. And the order of verbs in multiverb constructions is largely fixed. And this order depends on the particular verbs involved. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Helen, for your presentation. Uh, with that, we can begin the question and answer section. Um, so, as always, it will be open to both voice questions and written questions. So, if you have a voice question, please raise your hands using the uh, participant panel, uh, and I will send a request to unmute um, for those wishing to uh, ask a written question. Just put it in the chat and I will read it out. And I see a hand from Martin, and you should be able to unmute. Yes. Thank you, Helen. That's fascinating, always. Um, you had this question, and I have no answer to it, uh, about um, um, what was it that you that you have a, a conjunction on on the second clause, and then the interpretation is reason or cause. Um, uh, yeah, those ones. Uh, do you get? Is it always uh, that kind of interpretation of, of reason or cause or what? Um, maybe you said so, but a bit fast for um, me. No, all the examples I have come across have been, um, if it's the narrative conjunction, then it's the, the reason, the cause. And if it's the subjunctive conjunction, then it's a, it would be translated otherwise. It's a possible okay. consequence. Okay. 
And the first one is, is that with the different uh, persons or is it always first person? It's, it will match whatever the subject of the first clause is. So, so, it, so you also have that with third person. And, uh, yeah, it, it works with um, all the different ones. I mean, it, it surprised me at first because I thought maybe it's just a, a morpheme with the same um, same form, mm -hmm. but actually it does, it matches up. And I think there was, um, there was one example which was quite complex in the first clause, but you could swap the, choose a different conjunction for the second clause and then refer back to one or the other of the participants in the first clause. It was something like, Ruth just said to Lion, you should do this or something. And depending on which conjunction you chose, it was clear that you were saying rooster or lion. So um, yeah, it certainly relates to the subject. Uh, fascinating, and I, I <laughs> yes, I will. It will go through my head for the for the time to come. But I have no no <laughs> suggestions. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, though. <laughs> I think I see Marta again has a raised hand. As a reaction to all, well, yeah, uh, and and yeah, well, uh, I I didn't see any other questions coming up then. So, but uh, it's, maybe it's not fair. I'm I'm fascinated by this nazarity. I just want to ask you whether this final nazarity, whether that can be separated from the word, and um, and what what are the functions? Okay, um, there's, well, there's two kinds that we've seen. There's the low toned and the high toned. So the low toned is specificity, or possibly definiteness, depending on who you ask. Um, and that one can't be separated from what it attaches to. Uh -huh. uh, it's, but the one that I've called connective, that yeah. I've glossed with an ampersand, is mm -hmm. high toned. And that one, I understand it as coming from the um, freestanding ning for and. Um, I don't think I had an example of that, but um, for a lot of the uses of that connective, you can uh, replace it with uh, ning, the word. Um, so it seems to have come from that. Thank you. Yeah, I was asking because uh, Southern Kushitic, they have this uh, final word, which sometimes uh, or were even added and sometimes it's not. And I wonder whether this is some that were influenced. Thank you. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Then I see a question in the chat from Bonnie Sands, which is, uh, is it typical for SOV languages to have conjunctions at the end? Yeah, I don't know the answer to that, but I, if anyone does, <laughs> do speak up because that's um, interesting. And then I see a raised hand by uh, André Swab. Um, hello. Um, thank you for this really interesting talk. I had a question about the demonstratives. Um, you said that the demonstrative sometimes follows the head noun and sometimes precedes it in a case of focus. Um, mm -hmm. Is, if I understood correctly, the unmarked um, the unmarked version is for the demonstrative to follow the noun, right? Um, that's what Sander Stamen found. Yes, I, I'm. I looked back at my data and my, and I've not made a, my position clear on it because I, I'm not sure that I, I felt confident either way. I certainly have plenty of examples of both, but I'm not totally sure because I feel like for some of the ones where the demonstrative follows the noun, I could equally argue that there was. Um, some kind of pragmatic marking or contrast. So, um, yeah, I'm not sure. So it might be more complicated. Yeah, I. It's not something I've looked at. So I. Mm. Yeah, I don't feel like I can give an opinion okay. on that. I'm not sure if, apart from Sander, I'm not sure if anyone else has um, spoken out on that topic. But um, yeah, that was his position. It Thank certainly you. fits with example 13. Um, <laughs> the context is very, it's a context talking about a dowry and talking about different animals being contributed by different relatives. So it, it does fit quite nicely with that, certainly. Thank you. 
I'm just thinking a bit more about the um, the question about conjunctions at the ends of clauses. And I suppose um, one thing that you could say about Sandawi is that the postpositional uh, morphemes, um, one of those has a, a causal meaning. Um, it's either kme or me. And um, that one would be that is a post position. So that would be at the end and it could be at the end of um, of a clause. So in that sense, I guess conjunctions can be at the end. But in the as I showed in the narrative clauses in what seems to be the basic order, um, they are initial in the clause. And I see a bit of chatter in the chat. Um, I think I just start with the actual question by uh, Michael Karani, which is in 13, this calf may sound like top authorization. Uh, so he asked, is there a pause uh, or a comma to indicate that? That's a good question. Yeah, there isn't in the Sandawe, but um, I, I want to put it in in the English. I didn't deliberately because that's not how it sounded in the Sandawe. Although I would consider it a, a topicalization. Um, just without a very obvious pause, at least in the recording I had. And then I see another written question by um, Edward Elkin, who asks, uh, have you any comments on the sequence of yang and another verb? Um, yeah, I'm trying to work out that one, but I, I know what you mean, Ed. Um, there are some um, differences to do with uh, whether to actions are simultaneous or sequential. And I think when I was listening to the recording, I realized I said one of them wrong. I think I made some comment that wasn't correct. Let me have a look at the example. Um, so if something like um, listening, uh, so we have ke'e uh, and neng, the connective being on the neng is how that means uh, to be listening. If the connective were on the keng, then it would be to listen and then to stay. So um, the, the key in one sense is the position of the connective or the placement where which verb the connective is on. But I, I would have to look up some examples of that. But um, there is also a pattern with sequentiality and simultaneity, but I can't really recall it without looking it up now, I'm afraid. I think I'm thinking about it more and trying to remember the examples, but I think did it, a lot of it does depend on the verbs involved. So stay and stop and finish are kind of classic ones for um, aspect. Basically, they contribute the aspect to the clause. But if you have two verbs which which wouldn't go together in that kind of way, like listening and swimming, for example, I think then if you if you had keeng pundu say that would be listen and then swim. But if you had Ke pundu seng, it would be listen while swimming. I think that's what it is, but I will um, look that up later and let you know, Ed. No, in that case, uh, just for me, just for me to say thank you, Helen. Uh, I think those were all the questions and comments for today. Um, so I'd like to take this opportunity to remind everyone that recordings of all of the presentations in the Rift Valley webinar series can be found on the Rift Valley Network YouTube page. And entries for each presentation are added to the Rift Valley bibliography. Uh, looking ahead for the next webinar, uh, it's going to be on Wednesday, the 24th of February. It will be presented by Amani Lusukelo, and it will be titled Plant Nomenclature and Ethnobotany uh, of the Hatsabe Society of Tanzania. With that, I would like to ask, uh, thank Helen again uh, for her presentation and of course everyone else for participating today. And I hope to see you again at our next webinar.